I woke up this morning to a couple of very good comments by Nicholas de Salentio in my previous video, um, and I think that we've reached um, some sort of um, position where we can identify where the log jam is here. Assuming it is a log jam, but at least it, we're, we're narrowing the um, scope for misunderstanding here. Uh, a couple of sort of emphatically made comments. The first one was, relativism leads to the inability to arbitrate disagreement. Now, let's examine that statement. That statement was made very emphatically, and I'm glad it was, because I want to see what the um, what the bottom line is here that we're discussing. Now, does relativism lead to the inability to arbitrate uh, disagreement? Well, before I go into this, I want to back up a bit and make something clear, and I think everyone is clear on this already, but Nicholas and I are sort of, in a sense, hostilely applying labels to each other. I'll admit that. Um, in a sense, as I said in other videos, that's inevitable. But I think that you have to bear in mind that, in a sense, you're, you're, when you label somebody, you're sort of misrepresenting them. I won't go so far as to, again, quote Kierkegaard here and say, if you label me, you negate me, but I would say if you label something, you misrepresent it, because you apply a label for utility, not for actual truth. Now, um, I'm calling him an absolutist, he's calling me a relativist. All right, now, I think that we understand that that might not be all that accurate, but we're trying to sort of get at what the other person is saying, and, and to a certain extent, a bit of labeling there is inevitable. So I think that we'll just not, or I'm not going to worry too much about being called a relativist. I'll just sort of go with the flow here. Now, um, relativism leads to the inability to arbitrate disagreement in bold majuscules. Let's look at that. Is that an accurate thing to say? Or what are the assumptions built into that statement? <clears throat> it leads to the inability to arbitrate disagreement. Now, what does that mean to arbitrate a disagreement? Now, it's interesting because I've been involved in arbitrations all of my adult life. I'm active in the labor movement, um, and I'm familiar with labor arbitration. Now, labor arbitration is different from legal arbitration, where the burden of proof is different. In labor arbitration, you go with balance of probabilities. In other words, what probably happened. There's no presumption of innocence, and there's uh, the burden of proof is not as heavy as when you're dealing with, say, a criminal case, where it's almost with almost appalling frankness. You're, you're, you're asked by the judge to say, is this person guilty or not guilty? Now, that's an interesting thing. That's an interesting sort of um, way that it's phrased in our society, and I think that it's interesting that people don't even question that. Um, there's one difference between two types of arbitration. You have two people agree upon a um, third party to arbitrate between two disputing parties. Or you have the force of the state behind um, a judge who has the authority to say, in effect, metaphysically, one person is either wrong or not wrong in a sort of moral, ethical, absolute kind of sense. Um, and I would question whether or not a trial by a judge for a criminal matter is an arbitration. An arbitration, to my view of things, is two people with a, an intractable dispute uh, bring it to a third party whose decision is final and binding on both, and they have both consciously and deliberately agreed to abide by the um, the decision of the arbitrator with the um, 
understanding that they have the option of refusing to abide by the um, by the verdict of, or it's not even really a verdict, it's called a decision of the arbitrator. So when you approach an arbitration, an actual arbitration where it's based upon balance of probabilities and no presumption of innocence or anything like that, and when, when a decision is made, it's not said that this person is bad or anything like that, guilty or whatever, um, you've, got, you, you've got an entirely different emphasis because in an actual arbitration, both sides have the option of just ignoring the verdict and going on as before. With the um, end result, conflict, if you refuse to abide by the decision of the arbitrator, the conflict remains unresolved. When you go to an arbitrator, it's assumed that both sides want to have the, um, the issue solved in a non-confrontational way, or at least in a way in a venue where um, we can limit the damage done by confrontation. <clears throat> in a court case where it's guilty or not guilty, right and wrong, moral absolutes, um, you get um, you get all of that, plus you get um, somebody who's saying absolutely this person is right and this person is wrong. And there's no option of ignoring the verdict and choosing conflict. It's not a question between um, negotiation and um, compromise on the one hand and conflict and the, potentially, the potential for both sides being more damaged than they would like to be at the end of the day. It's just we're going to we're going to hand over our decision making power to someone who has ultimately the authority to decide absolutely if one is right and one is wrong. In other words, we expect judges in our society to have access to absolute right and absolute wrong, and not just what we've agreed upon is absolutely right and absolutely wrong, but what actually is right and wrong as far as we're able to capture that. Um, okay, so those are the two positions. Relativism leads to the inability to arbitrate disagreement. I would say that it doesn't, because the main thing is, you're saying here that the main thrust of any arbitration process is conflict resolution. That's how I see conflict. I tend to see, I look at, say, the Israeli-Arab issue, and I say, what's the problem here? Is it the Israelis, or is it the Arabs, or is it the conflict itself? I say the problem is the conflict itself. Um, and in fact, I would argue that it was the, the insistence on saying one side is right and one side is wrong, this prolonging it. It's the same thing with my experiences in growing up with you know everyone talking in my community about the troubles in Northern Ireland. Whose fault is it? That's what kept it going forever. It's when they both decided that what we really want here is to end the conflict, that we can actually now s seek to end it. Because, again, in certain intractable conflicts, there's just absolutely no way you're going to get one side to admit that we are at fault here and you are absolutely right and then therefore the conflict goes on forever there's a reason for this of course there's a reason why you why conflicts become intractable and it becomes impossible for people to get into a position where they will admit that the other person is right in an arbitration that is not in a enforced sort of judicial decision ie if you get the united states military telling two factions in, say, Syria. I'm not saying that this is what's happening, by the way. But, for example, let's say that they did, like, let's say the U.S. military, or the, in many ways the Western coalition, does in Syria what they did in Bosnia. They said, okay, here's our decision as to how things are going to be in Syria. And um, we've decided that, say, the Syrian regime is in the wrong, or ISIS is in the wrong, or whatever. We've decided that um, that we're gonna we're gonna come down on the side of the Syrian regime because of all the you know, on, on balance of evidence we think that if there's a right and a wrong here, it's the Syrian regime that's in the right. So the Syrian regime is in the right and we have decided to put the entire force of Western military power on the side of that decision. In other words, we're going to blast the enemies of the Syrian regime. That's more like what 
in in an absolute sense when you when you would arbitrate a um, a dispute. That's what you would do. Now this assumes, of course, that the judge is impartial. You really think that the United States is impartial in Syria and Bosnia and things like that? I don't think so. Um, I, I, this is no criticism of the United States. This is simply human nature. The United States has vested interests in those places. Are they going to not take those vested interests into consideration? When you go into a courtroom in front of a judge and you see all rise and the formality of it all and the clothes that the judge are, is wearing and the sergeant at arms standing there and uh, the prison just waiting on the other side of the door uh, from the from the uh, courtroom, or perhaps even the the um, prisoner is being tried from a cage, you understand that this isn't an arbitration. Uh, this is not a negotiation even. This is just two sides, two small people pleading their cases in front of one enormous person who has the ultimate authority of the state behind him. Um, so I, I would say that when, you, when, you, when you're dealing with things like right and wrong, you can't even arbitrate disagreements. You're not arbitrating anything. You're just deciding, and then you're acting on that decision. Um, <clears throat> now, in an arbitration, you don't need to know who's right and who's wrong, because that's not what you're trying to get at. You're not trying to get a fair um, compromise here. Look at, say, the, the peace process in places where peace is actually held like Northern Ireland, like um, to a certain extent Bosnia, although as I say Bosnia is ultimately the, the peace is holding simply because of the, the, the knowledge among the potential combatants that if they go to war again they'll call down uh, fire from the sky again and get blasted back to the, to, to the negotiation table. There's no fear of this in say in Northern Ireland or in other places where they've negotiated a, a peace, it's based upon the premise that we really, really, really don't want to fight anymore. We want to avoid war, even if it means we have to sort of negotiate with people whom we believe are fundamentally wrong. Um, and <clears throat> I would say that absolutism gets in the way of this. Absolutism, or an absolute view of truth um, leads to ideas like non-cooperation with evil. Now you think that that's innocuous, but it's not, because you've decided in advance that somebody is evil. If you look at, say, Gandhi and uh, the Gandhian view of things, or Martin Luther King or whatever, there's a powerful moral component in there that has to decide in advance that our side is moral, their side is immoral, our side is ethical, their side is unethical, and we're just not going to cooperate with that which is unethical and that which is immoral. So before you even act, you've already passed judgment on the other side, and you've said that they are wrong. Now, <clears throat> how is that going to actually long-term play out? Well, what it does is it empowers people who say that they are the victim, for one thing. That I am the person who's, who's, being, who's been wronged here, and therefore I don't really have to negotiate at all because I'm in the wrong, or I'm in the right here. Um, so you're not really negotiating anymore. I, you know, you say, I, I refuse to, to engage in this negotiation process because what it does is it amounts to the fact that, you know, me conferring some sort of legitimacy on your claims. Not necessarily. Again, I keep pointing to Northern Ireland, the Catholics and the Protestants, which is kind of not really accurate. I, I would say maybe the, the Loyalists or Unionists versus the Nationalists or the Republicans really do not uh, fundamentally agree on anything in Northern Ireland, at least in terms of... Um, right and wrong in the issue. Each side is absolutely sure that the other side is wrong. But they have agreed, based upon the, des the, the, the mutual desire, and it's a powerful desire, to end the conflict, to sort of say, okay, on the basis of only Nixon can go to China, the respective hardliners on both sides negotiated a compromise that each could live with. And it's not even necessarily a compromise. It's just like, what do you really want here? Let's say you can't have what you believe is justice, because we simply cannot agree on what a just solution is here. What can you live with? You can negotiate with people whom you fundamentally disagree right down to the level of 
sincerely believing you are negotiating with someone who is from the very beginning wrong. In if you adopt, or at least if you step back from the idea of absolute truth, if people had stuck to ideas of absolute truth, say in um, in uh, Northern Ireland, they'd still be fighting. They'd still be throwing bombs at each other. Because each side, and I was inclined to go knows, but it's no, it's it, there's no quotation marks there. In Northern Ireland, each side knows that it is in the right, and the other side is simply in the wrong. And I, it's my contention, although I've never uh, been there since the peace process was for, finalized, it's my contention that they still more or less feel that way. The nationalists still believe that the Unionists are wrong, and absolutely wrong, and the Unionists still believe that the Republicans or nationalists, or whatever you want to call them, are absolutely wrong, and that, you know, there's just, you're not going to change people's minds on that score. But that's secondary to what the primary aim of the negotiation that ended the violence is, or I won't say ended it, but more or less ended it on any sort of um, formal level. Um, the main thrust was ending the conflict, not um, determining who is right and who is wrong. Um, a conflict that goes on forever is one where both sides are absolutely and unutterably convinced that uh, they are right and the other side is simply wrong. That's you know that's the the recipe for an endless conflict, unless of course they have put something higher than that, something higher than the truth value of what they believe. And in, in in this case, it's conflict resolution. What do you want? Well, we want right to prevail. You think right can prevail on a planet populated by human beings? Okay, human beings are rational, reasonable, logical beings. I agree. Human beings are many other things as well. We are both logical and illogical. Um, we are both rational and irrational. We are both cerebral and emotional. The hatreds that build up over a long period of time in a real conflict, in a real war, are not rational. And But they still exist, as I say. I think that the hatreds, say, in a lot of traditional conflict zones like uh, southeastern Europe, like Northern Ireland, um, like any number of other places, the Middle East, um, it isn't really rational what's keeping the war going. What's what's keeping the war gro going is a gut level belief that we are the right people, we are the good people, and they are the wrong people or the bad people, or even or at least just in terms of this case, we can't cooperate with what they're doing because we're going to be in league with the devil here. We're going to abandon our principles by going for peace. That was why Yitzhak Rabin was killed, in my opinion, when he was. No, it looked like he was on the point of negotiating a permanent peace with the Palestinian leadership of Yasser Arafat. It just looked insane that he should be shaking that man's hand in front of a camera. So an Israeli said, he's just selling us out to pure evil. We have to kill him. Um, I know I'm giving the Israeli hard right the, the benefit of the doubt here, but I think that, that a lot of these people are sincere, however much you might disagree with them. I think that, say, the hard line Israeli hard right at least believes itself to be in the right. Um, and it, likewise, Fatah and uh, Hamas and uh, Hezbollah and all these groups, they believe that they are in the right, that it's a question of good and evil, it's a question of right and absolute wrong here. And so they're not going to back down one instant. They're going to say, look, if you if you cooperate with evil, you're perpetuating it. And, and negotiating with somebody who is evil is to cooperate. It's to confer some legitimacy on their position, which they simply don't have. So, relativism leads to the inability to arbitrate disagreement. I fundamentally disagree with that premise. I would say that um, believing in absolutes is what prevents arbitration. Um, if you have a more or less equally powerful um, pair of opponents, there's no real incentive um, to arbitrate anything if you believe that it's a matter of right or wrong. 
unless, of course, the real motive for entering into uh, an arbitration process is to avoid the continuation or the escalation of hostilities. We don't want any, any, any more young men slain, as they said, in the streets of Belfast. We've had enough of this. We've had enough of funerals for 18-year-old men, quite apart from the fact that you know, we have actual things that we're fighting over here, like who should actually be have the ultimate say in Ulster. Should it be London or should it be Dublin? We both feel very strongly about that, but in a sense, we both get it that we don't want to see people killed anymore. We want people to be able to go about their normal lives like most people in the rest of the world. That's ultimately what they, what they want, is an end to the conflict, not right or wrong. Now, I'm not saying that people in conflict zones who have successfully managed to negotiate um, a, a, a modus vivendi um, or an armistice, because again, you're not talking about an absolute decision here. You're talking about, we won't fight anymore based on these negotiations. If you see places where they've actually managed to negotiate that, there's a very good possibility that neither side believes that it has that, that it has abdicated any of its quote-unquote rightness. Uh, again, Northern Ireland comes to mind. Um, the I think that you know, in terms of what people believe is the moral and the ethical case to be made in that conflict, both sides are pretty certain of their positions, and they're as certain as they ever were. But what they have agreed upon is more important than this is ending the conflict. So relativism actually can actually help stop a conflict uh, by saying, okay, well, we're never going to agree on, on absolute truth here, but what we will agree upon is the fact that we want this conflict stopped. We have real-world examples of this. <coughs> we have real-world examples of non-negotiated compromises. As I say, the perfect case of that is Southeastern Europe, Bosnia, Croatia, Serbia, Albania, Kosovo, places like this, where a, a quote-unquote neutral or disinterested third party who really isn't so neutral or disinterested, NATO, the United States, more or less chose one side with the force of its um, military, said, you're right, you're wrong. If you don't want to abide by this decision, that's fine. We'll just blast you into back to the negotiating table, or we'll simply blast you out of existence if that's what we have to do. That is not an arbitration. It's an arbitration that is wearing the mask of a disinterested third party adjudicating between two uh, warring parties. But it's basically, no. Um, we... Um, we're right, you're wrong, and we're, we, since we have so many big guns, we can actually show you how right we are. Okay. Um, now, the second point was, I do seem to have chosen skepticism as an end in itself. Another label. No, I have not chosen skepticism as an end in itself. Um, Again, I'll, say, I'll just repeat this forever. People who watch my videos, you'll never see anyone as dogged as I am, and I'm maddeningly dogged. Um, I am not a skeptic as an end in itself. I want to see things more clearly, and I want to take um, bias as much as is humanly possible out of what I am seeing. Not out of what I'm doing or saying, but how I'm seeing the universe. I want to remove bias in as much as that is even remotely possible. Um, again, you can constantly phrase things in terms of black and white, right and wrong, but I'm going to constantly rejoin her with, that's not what I'm doing. Um, the question eventually becomes, is it more arrogant to believe you have an immortal soul or to doubt your own existence? Again, a starkly phrased question that limits no other option but this Manichaean split. You're either for us or against us. End of story. It, you cannot. There's no third option whatsoever. Now, that's interesting to speak of. I was talking a lot about Ulster here. In the old days, the joke that went around was you wanted to stay out of the conflict, and it, Ulster was kind of one of those conflicts where you weren't really allowed to be neutral. Um, this um, 
the joke went, if you were a, a Jewish uh, Ulsterman, and there are a few, people would ask, um, they'd say, well, what side are you on? Are you a Catholic or a Protestant? And, you know, you'd say, well, heh, I'm Jewish. I'm not in either camp at all. I want to stay out of this. And both sides would pin you down further and saying, are you a Catholic Jew or are you a Protestant Jew? Knowing full well that there's no such thing in Judaism. But it, the point is, this is Ulster. You can't be neutral here. There's no such position as neutrality. Um, that's what I glean from this statement. The question eventually becomes, is it more arrogant to believe you have an immortal soul or to doubt your own existence? It's that stark, literally. It doesn't matter. All the other stuff is just, you know, dressing. What do you believe, one or the other? There is no other option but these two. That is certainty. Now, let's say you do come down on one side or the other. The question eventually becomes, is it more arrogant to believe you have a, you are an, an immortal soul or to doubt your own existence? If I sort of say, I'm going to, I'm going to say, is it more arrogant to believe you are, you, are, you are an immortal soul? And I say, no, I don't believe that I'm an immortal soul. The only possible um, other option here of believing you are an immortal soul is to doubt your own existence, full stop. There's no other possibility here. Okay, you're phrasing the issue that way in a Manichaean, dualistic, loaded kind of black-white, right-wrong um, context from the absolute get-go before we can do anything. There's a... It's a question with a hole in its heart, or it's a solution with a hole in its heart. You have to decide right or wrong. And if you disagree with me you are automatically saying this no matter what you say you're actually saying something else and you're just plain wrong what do you do in a conflict when both sides do that to each other